Um, so my name is Clara Duzal. I'm a data analyst at SDSN and I'm part of the Fable Consortium, which aims to understand how countries can transition towards sustainable land use and food systems. Um, in particular, we ask how countries can collectively meet the SDGs and the objectives of the Paris Agreement. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I should let you know that this webinar is being recorded and that it will be made available on the SDSN website later. Uh, we will have an opportunity for questions and answers with the panelists. So please do use the, the Q&A uh, option from Zoom to submit any question that you have as they come to mind. Um, so today's webinar, as you might know, is about digitalization and sustainable agriculture. So why uh, we wanted to do a webinar on that topic? Well, because the world stands at a critical moment to deliver on the 2030 agenda for sustainable development. And innovation is seen as an important means to achieve food security and the sustainable development goals. Um, innovation is important to realize the productive potential of family farmers, especially in small and medium-sized family farms that occupy a large share of farmland and produce much of the food in low and middle income countries. So on top of the existing challenges that the food system was and still is facing, the COVID-19 pandemic has put unprecedented stress on agricultural food and laid bare many weaknesses in our institutions and systems. This has generated much attention on digitization as a solution to several challenges. And many have emphasized that digitization can reduce the need for middlemen and brokers, and also to facilitate a greater share of profits going back to farmers. Many also emphasize its potential to build in resilience to shocks, as well as reduce inefficiency through greater equality of access to robust information. So we, got, we are going to have the opportunity to expose some of these questions today by presenting case studies in digitization from different national contexts and operating at different scales. So I'm very pleased that we have with us today Xinyi Lin. She's Executive Director for Sustainability and Agricultural Impact of uh, Pinduoduo in China. Pinduoduo is China's largest agricultural platform, connecting 16 million farmers to over 800 million active buyers. We'll also have Jamie Collinson, and um, he is CTO for ISDA Africa, and today we'll be presenting Virtual Agronomist. A virtual agronomist is an artificial intelligence designed to help smallholders apply the right amount of fertilizer and predict realistic crop yields. We will also have Emeka Nwatinemere, who is CEO of Kitovu Technology in Nigeria. Kitovu provides smallholder farmers with the data to make small decisions about what to grow that would sell and how to grow them optimally. Um, and finally, from a more global perspective, we will have Jawu Ku, who is a senior research fellow at IFPRI, so the International Food Policy Research Institute, um, which is a food policy think tank that conducts research to develop policy solutions for reducing poverty and ending hunger and malnutrition. His team studies the potential of digital innovation that can help low and middle income countries achieve SDGs. His presentation today will focus, uh, will discuss new challenges that policymakers will need to understand and address for effectively managing climate risk using digital technologies. So I'm going to hand over to you, Xinyi Lin, who will present Pinduoduo. Thank you. So thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this um, sharing session. Um, I'm Cindy Lim. I'm the Executive Director of Sustainability and Agricultural Impact at Pinduoduo. Uh, hopefully you can all see my slides. I've just got a couple here um, that will give you a little bit of an idea of who we are and what we do. So we were founded in 2015 uh, and uh, we have since um, you know, built up a very large 
uh, user base of over 860 million buyers on one side. And then on the other side, we've got about 16 million farmers who are connected through our platform and they're able to sell their produce directly to uh, consumers across all of China. In 2020, we facilitated about $42 billion worth of agricultural produce uh, sales. So that includes things like fresh produce, uh, fish, meat, um, rice, oil, tea. So pretty much running the whole gamut uh, and really helping um, the farmers in China you know, gain more market access. And this has been something that we've been focused on since day one. So when we were founded in 2015, we started out doing agricultural product sales uh, before you know, we then branched out into other categories of goods um, as our user base got larger. So because we've been working um, on agriculture related um, you know, uh, digitization since the first day of our company's founding, uh, we are also very aware of the opportunities for digitization to bring more efficiency into the agricultural sector. So to that end, um, last year in August, we announced our 10 billion agriculture initiative, which aims to address critical needs in the agricultural sector and rural communities. So that's us pledging up to 10 billion RMB of our profits starting from the second quarter last year to go towards uh, investing in um, projects. So it could be research projects, it could be projects relating to farmer training or infrastructure, for instance. So in a nutshell, what we do is basically um, digitizing the agricultural product sales. So on the slide here, you'll see on the left a uh, screenshot of our user interface. So being a platform that started in 2015, we're a mobile only platform. It emphasizes um, you know, more savings, more fun. That's our slogan. So it's very intuitive and interactive kind of user interface that you see here. It's a feed that is presented to you. So not so much oriented by search, although there is a search bar at the top, as you can see, but it is basically dynamic and adjusting according to you know, how you interact with the app, what sort of interest you're showing. So here um, we've toggled to the fruit category. So you can see there's a variety of listings that are being recommended um, to the user. And so as the user shops and interacts, you know, they might be able to discover some agricultural products that they previously maybe weren't aware of or were not specifically looking out for. So this in particular is also very helpful because for agricultural products in particular, we find that users um, can also be influenced by their friends around them. So potentially the orders can be aggregated. So what do I mean by this? If you look on the right side of the slide, you'll see um, the detailed page of a listing that we've clicked into. So this is dried mangoes. So on the platform, we also have a function called the team purchase. So on the bottom of the slide, you'll see that um, you know, there's a pink box that has 21.6 inside. So that's the uh, individual purchase price. And then the red box has um, 8.3, which is the team purchase price. So significantly cheaper if you buy as part of a team. Now, how do you form a team? Because the platform is already the largest in China by number of users, um, actually just forming a team involves just one more person. So it's actually very easy. So what I could do is if I want to buy the dried mangoes, I could um, you know, click on it and share the link with a friend. So say I want to invite Clara and I send her a link through um, you know, my social uh, networks, in this case, WeChat. So she could just click on the link and join me in the purchase and we would both pay 8.3, which is a team purchase price and get the box of dried mangoes shipped to our homes uh, individually. So it's very convenient for the user. They're incentivized to help share the listings. And it's also very powerful for the farmer because now instead of me uh, buying the mangoes and maybe Clara would buy the apples from another seller, you know, she actually got persuaded by me sharing the link, right? Because I'm a friend, she trusts my recommendation and she thinks, hey, actually the mangoes look pretty good as well. So I don't mind having mangoes instead of apples. So that then helps to aggregate more orders onto a narrow range of uh, suppliers. So they actually get a lot more visibility into the orders that they have in a given window of time. So this then translates to more upstream savings whereby they can actually you know, um, coordinate on the logistics and um, also then pass on some of those savings you know, as the cost uh, per parcel comes down because of volume, pass it on to the consumer. 
So this just illustrates uh, what I was talking about in terms of streamlining the distribution chain. So over here on the top half of the slide, you can see what is a typical uh, kind of offline distribution uh, value chain. So the farmer who's selling garlic in this exam example maybe gets quoted a price of two RMB per kilogram. So a lot of the farmers in China, the smallholder farmers, they don't really have the ability to set pricing. So what then happens is that there's a lot of different intermediaries who are involved, um, you know, the regional distributor and the wholesaler, et cetera, before it finally makes its way to a retail outlet where the consumer, maybe in a big city, you know, picks it up for 16 RMB a kilogram. So all of that markup was actually lost in the middle where, you know, there was the manpower cost, there was the warehousing cost, distribution cost, et cetera, which in today's sort of digital age, doesn't actually need to be incurred. So on the bottom half of the slide, what you see is a more streamlined distribution chain that is also more transparent to both the farmer and the consumer. So on one hand, you know, starting on the right, you've got the consumer who now maybe is able to buy the garlic at four RMB per kilogram. So it's a no brainer for them. They're paying a quarter of what they used to pay. But at the same time, the farmer is able to um, still make more 30% higher income because now, uh, you know, after taking out the additional um, kind of packaging or uh, shipping costs that they previously didn't have to be uh, footing, they're now able to actually still make a higher income, right? So that's also a win for them and the consumer gets, uh, you know, fresher produce in a shorter window of time. So there's also less food loss and waste that's incurred along the way. We estimate it's about a 40% reduction in the volume that would have been lost otherwise. And another way that we're trying to transform kind of the midstream efficiency of um, you know, agricultural sales online is through this service called Dodo Grocery, which we launched just over a year ago. So what Dodo Grocery does is trying to match localized supply and demand together so that the consumers are able to get the products in less than 24 hours. So in the model that I outlined earlier, you know, there could be some specialty fruit or produce that's only grown in one part of China. So if I live in another part and I just really want to get that specialty fruit, um, I would have to wait maybe about two to three days for that box of fruit to reach me. But if it's something that is actually a lot more um, common, right, like rice or eggs, for instance, or parsley, things that are grown in a lot of places and also available locally, um, you could actually have that you know, delivered and travel a shorter distance to you. So for these sorts of products that, you know, maybe people are counting on for their daily necessities for cooking, they're actually able to place the order on our platform by 11 p.m. on the first day and pick it up themselves after 4 p.m. the very next day at a local pickup point of their choice. So what this does is that it cuts out the last mile delivery cost which then becomes a cost saving that we can spread out with the consumer. The consumer has a better uh, user experience. They're walking maybe 200 meters to the nearby, uh, you know, barbershop or the convenience store and they're picking it up. And they're also getting pretty fresh produce because it's traveling a much shorter distance. So this then gives users a um, lot more flexibility in terms of having another way of buying fresh produce and uh, getting it in a very short turnaround time. And so ultimately, what we hope to do is leverage the insights that we're able to have as um, the leading agricultural platform to help the midstream where we work with the third party logistics providers become more efficient. So um, we are then able to reduce further food loss and waste if we can actually use some of those insights in terms of you know, predicting a certain amount of demand is going to show up in a certain place by a certain time. Uh, what is the volumes that need to be moved? What is the best way that they can actually do the route planning so that they minimize the downtime? How can they improve the efficiency or the utilization rate of the trucks, et cetera? So what that does is that it further reduces the cost of shipping these agricultural products to the end consumer. Now, the, the midstream is one part of it, but the upstream is also very critical. So for you know, all efforts to consistently um, you know, yield a good effect, we need to actually work with the farmers. So we have a program called Dodo Academy, where we've been training farmers both through online and offline courses in terms of how to run a business effectively. How do you manage customer service? How do you take you know, good photos? How do you do a live stream? How do you, you know, manage sales? 
So these are things that um, you know, may not be apparent to a farmer, uh, but are critical for success uh, online. So we're proud to say that we've actually trained about half a million farmers so far. And of them, we have about 126,000 new farmers who are basically younger people who um, you know, have gone back to their hometowns to start their own businesses, be agricultural entrepreneurs, and they in turn mobilize the rest of their community to be part of their businesses. So either they procure from them or you know, the other people also join in in the packaging or in the logistics side of the businesses. So we also have partnerships with agricultural experts, uh, for instance, through China Agricultural University, we're able to provide further classes uh, online to the farmers, for instance, on specific topics uh, so that they can manage their crops better. And we've committed to training another 100,000 new farmers over the next five years. Uh, Total Farm is another example of how we're working uh, on the upstream to improve the efficiency of agricultural production. So what we've noticed is that, you know, sometimes there's technologies that are available um, and are known to the farmers, but they're not being applied, perhaps because of, you know, challenges around scale. So with the partnership of local governments, as well as um, experts from agronomy institutes, what we've done is to actually create a series of farmer cooperatives. So in this example here on the right side of the slide, um, that's a picture from our citrus farm uh, in Yunnan. So when I say our citrus farm, we don't own the farm, but we help to start uh, for the formation of the cooperative. So the farmers who live in the area are now organized in a cooperative. They collectively farm a much larger plot of land, which means they can now actually deploy some of the technologies like drip irrigation and drone spraying which then reduces the labor inputs that are needed, which is very important for an aging farming population and also reduces the fertilizer costs. So they're using 15% less fertilizer as a result. So with a tap on their phone, they can use drones to spray instead. They can you know, turn on the fertigation system, et cetera. So all of that is automated, it's labor saving. And ultimately, uh, you know, the farmers are able to make a better income as well, because with the uh, expert advice, they're able to grow a variety that is also um, yielding a higher price because it's, uh, you know, it, it bears fruit uh, off season. So there's greater demand for these kinds of produce. The Smart Agriculture Competition is another way in which we're trying Cindy, to... Can, can I ask you to, to um, wrap up? Uh, wrap yeah, this is the uh, last okay, slide. Thank you. So, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, so we're, we're, we're trying to bring um, technologies closer to the farmers by demonstrating to them what some of these cutting edge technologies like IoT and machine learning based kind of crop models are able to deliver in terms of better crop yields. So in 2020, we held the first competition where um, the AI teams that competed were able to use their crop models um, and also harness the power of IoT to grow three times more strawberries than conventional farmers competing in the adjacent greenhouse. And this year's competition, which just ended, also had a very successful uh, result whereby AI teams were again able to harness their crop models to not only improve the nutrition profile of the tomatoes that they grew, but also create a disease prediction platform. And now, you know, these uh, AI solutions are being brought to market and scaled more widely across the country. So ultimately, what we hope is to serve as a convener uh, to use our platform for good and to invest where um, there are critical needs to improve the overall efficiency and productivity of the overall agri-food value chain. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Singyi. Um, next, we will have uh, Jamie Collinson presenting Virtual Economist. Thank you, Clara. Um, and thanks, uh, Singyi, for the presentation. It was fascinating for me as well to, to listen. Um, I'm Jamie, I work for ISDA. We're a mission-driven company and we're focused on Africa. Uh, in particular, uh, our mission is to raise the income of African small-scale farmers. Um, and how do we do this? Um, our, our leading product is called Virtual Agronomist. So it, it's been known uh, in the research community for a long time now, since the 90s, that uh, site-specific nutrient management is it's known. So that's um, making an individualized recommendation for an, indi for, for an individual farm instead of a blanket regional recommendation <clears throat> offers significant um, 
savings, improvements in productivity, uh, you know, less fertilizer, more profit. Um, and so how do you do this? Uh, you know, our dream is to roll this out, this technology for every farmer. Um, so we're, we're a member focused on Africa uh, and for African smallholders, uh, the question is how do you get this out when digital connectivity isn't necessarily there? What are the things in the way? Uh, why can we not go and give individual advisory to every single smallholder? Uh, the first and the first one really is there just aren't enough agronomists. Uh, support systems are stretched. So extension agents often are looking after thousands of farmers. Um, and so they just can't give that depth of advice. Uh, so what we aim to do is provide a digital solution. That means that lower trained field officers can provide that same value. So we're putting AI in the palm of their hands so that they can uh, do a similar job to uh, more highly trained extension agents or agronomists. Um, another problem is that advice is often regional or actually aimed at larger farms. Um, and Sinead was mentioning this, uh, you know, big data and AI means we can start to tackle this problem. We can start to look at much smaller farms and provide individualized advice. Uh, and the last one I think is a big one really, uh, what prevents investment is uncertainty. And so what farmers need is the confidence that they can understand the system, they can understand their farm, uh, and they can understand what they'll get out of an investment. And so what we really aim to do is to make this a tool for users to be able to understand their farm, try different scenarios, understand what are the risks, what are the rewards uh, of putting in that money. Um, what does it look like? I'm not gonna give you a, a demo here, but let's just spin through. Um, it's very easy to imagine some AI system that's really complicated, but actually what's key really is understanding what's going on on the ground. Um, what we need to ask is the kind of questions that a local agronomist would. Uh, what's happened in the field before? What are current yields at the moment? What, what's the best yield that your neighbor's getting? Uh, you know, what have you been growing before? What do you plan to grow? Is there any pest problem here? What's your plan? You know, what, uh, what kind of practice do you have? Uh, so we ask simple questions. This app can be, uh, you know, a field agent can be trained up to use this very quickly. Uh, and then the app is really get providing that expert knowledge. So it's been tailored for the location, for the crop, uh, and also for the economics of the, of the value chain. Um, and by working through this, the app is then providing uh, a target yield. So um, many of these applications, if you've seen them before, this kind of approach, it's often the user supplies uh, what they're trying to reach, but that obviously isn't realistic. Uh, you know, the, an agronomist would come and tell you what's reasonable, and that, that's our approach. Uh, what's the output? I mean, our aim is to provide an individual plan for every farm. Uh, so this, you can see on the side, is, a, is an individual nutrient application plan for that particular field. Uh, so it's very important to know what products are available locally, what fertilizer products, uh, what their prices are, what the compatibilities of those products are. Um, and by combining these individually for, an in, for, for a particular field, uh, a farmer can often make uh, 30 to 40 percent saving. And that's an economic saving, but it's also um, more sustainable. We're not throwing nutrients away uh, by doing this. So broad applications tend to be less efficient. And then, of course, by applying this year after year, you have better information from uh, what the farm did last year, uh, what the farmer tried last year, what worked, what didn't. Um, and so by building this up, we can work towards continuous improvement. That's really what we see as being a sustainable way forwards for smallholders is that they can build year on year, keep building their profit, uh, keep understanding their field, uh, keep uh, changing things, learning and, and adapting, changing conditions, obviously a reality with climate change. So we see this as a holistic approach. Um, it's very easy to just look at agronomy in, uh, in the small, but what we need to do to make recommendations, if you were speaking to a real agronomist who's coming to visit your farm, they take a holistic approach. Um, so understanding the field history and the region, that's very important, but it's just as important to understand the economics. What should you grow, why? Uh, if the prices are changing, uh, inputs and outputs, then obviously, what you should do will change. Um, it's also understand, it, it's key to understand the dynamic factors. So weather, pest and disease, 
you know, you need to understand those to, to factor in what's possible at that location and what the risks are. And really where we start is the soil. Uh, so this is an important thing to understand. Each farm, each field, uh, its, uh, its capability is really defined by the soil and the ongoing soil health is critical. So how do you do that for smallholders? They often can't afford small uh, soil tests. So we built um, a digital soil map we call Is the Soil. Um, this is based on over 100,000 training points uh, from across Africa, covers the whole continent except the Sahara. Um, and by using remote sensing and machine learning, uh, we can predict soil properties. This in particular is a, a pH map. We predict it at 30 meter resolution. And that means we get a pretty good idea of the variation at field level. Um, obviously uncertainty needs to be taken into account here. We can't literally test the soil for every location. So this is a prediction. Um, what does 30 meters mean? This is a 30 meter grid and those are typical smallholder fields. So you get some idea of the variation. Now, when you can do that, you can offer a very low cost uh, recommendation because you understand the soil without having to go through extensive extra hardware or lab tests. So soil maps mean you've got a base level of information. And as farmers make more money, they can afford more sophisticated tests. They can understand their, their land better. And as you build up that data, that can feed back in to the digital soil maps, which everybody can use. So we really see, you know, this is the data aspect. We can build this up as a community. And that actually is why our soil map is, uh, is open data. It's, it's open for everybody. And we encourage people to donate uh, their, their soil scans to it. We take a decision science approach. So this picture uh, illustrates the common saying, you know, never cross a stream that's on average three foot deep. Um, because farming is inherently uncertain. So what you have to do is advise farmers uh, so they can understand the risks, they can understand the investments. And that is uh, really key to, to us to understand uh, what risks, what investments farmers can make. There are lots of um, uh, stereotypes about smallholder farmers, but actually our, our experience is they can really understand these deep things. It just needs to be presented right. They can understand the pros and the cons. They are at heart entrepreneurial and that's what we that's what we embrace just aware of the time so i will just skip through this um <clears throat> since this session is about uh, digitalization i should mention that really farmers and farming is a is a personal thing so there's this we don't um underestimate the impact of the, the human factor of the last mile so what we actually do to, to build this digital system, to customize it, is we work with the local uh, output or input aggregators who are working with smallholder farmers every day. And we work with them to build this customized for their locality. Um, that's the only way you can get this really local knowledge uh, in Africa to, to build that into the system. Otherwise, you end up with, with very broad top-down approaches. It, it has to be bottom-up. And of course, crops respond differently in different locations. Uh, so models need to be customized for local, uh, for local conditions. So we use the best uh, scientific uh, data available, uh, including these large scale donor funded projects to be able to train these crop models so that virtual agronomists can understand you know, how, how, things will, um, how things will work in, in that particular location, that particular value chain. And then I should end just by saying, you know, the approach then is this is inherently uncertain. And so you have to monitor what's going on. So we then uh, get feedback from the individual farms uh, and we're looking at what works, what doesn't work. How can you improve the system? And I think that to us is the key to the sustainability piece as you keep getting better year on year. Um, I'll end there, but if anyone has any questions, feel free to put them in the, the chat and uh, or send me an email if you'd like. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Jamie. It was really, really interesting. Thank you. Uh, our next presenter will be Emekan Wachinemere. If you want to unmute yourself. Emeka, 
I see that you try to um, have your video on, but it's not. Yeah. Um, but we can hear you. Thank you. Just a second. Ah, perfect. It's working now. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. Um, so, um, several years ago, um, when man discovered farming, um, it was quite very, very simple. All he needed to do was get your seed, put it in the soil, and you were sure of a great harvest at the end of the day. Things were not complex, there was adequate land, and if you wanted to increase production, you just expanded the land you had. The weather was predictable. Um, you knew there were patterns that were used to, the soil was fertile, and you basically sold to markets that were near you, so there were no complex uh, logistic systems to worry about. Um, there were no distant markets um, with different standards, um, um, different crop varieties in demand and all that. And because you are selling within your environment uh, or, or near your community, um, you quickly sold out to people who are close to you. You didn't have to bother about storage infrastructure and all that. But all that has changed and it is affecting food production as we know it. I'd like to take you to a journey. It's a journey of a smallholder farmer in Nigeria. So a few years ago, um, just after I had finished my national youth service, um, I wanted to find out the reasons why um, there were some of all those limitations in the agricultural sector. Because in the course of the National Youth Service, I had done my first ever farm. So I didn't set out to get involved in agriculture. My plan was finish school, finish my service, get a professional job in quotes, preferably in the oil and gas sector, and then, um, you know, build a career from there. But in the course of farming, I found out that youths were very, very poor. The outcomes were not commensurate to the amount of hard work I put in. And then, worse still, at the end of the farming cycle, um, it was difficult finding fair buyers. The middlemen offer prices that basically didn't make sense at all. So at the end of that um, period, I began to try to find out why this was so, what made farming the way it was in Nigeria and by extension across Sub-Saharan Africa. In the course of my search, uh, it took me to several parts of the country. And in one of those journey, I met Hawa. Hawa is a typical smallholder farmer cultivating under a hectare. Um, she and, she and them, other smallholder farmers like her, produce over 80% of all the food consumed in Nigeria today. But the sad thing is that Hawaiian people like her cannot readily afford healthy foodstuff for themselves because of their low earnings. And these low earnings are largely because of the disruption that has happened in the agricultural space. There is climate change. The rains are not predictable anymore. Aside that, the farmers have a situation where the farms are already spent and they cannot afford to do land rotation any longer because they are, the availability of arable land is not as, as um, widespread as it used to be. So they farm on the same land year after year, rely on guesswork to make most of their decisions. And because they do that, the outcome is typically very, very poor yield. 
to put this in perspective, an African farmer does one fifth of the output of farmers in the US. As if that was not enough, when the farmer has produced, he loses 40 to 60% of everything he produces because he typically doesn't have access to uh, post-service infrastructure. And then when he decides to sell, he can lose up to 40% in incomes that he could have earned if he got better prices from his farms. These are some of the problems that we um, wanted to solve several years ago when we started Kitovu Technology Company. So at Kitovu, data is at the heart of what we do. We've used several platforms um, which allow us to um, solve the problems of farmers through a data-driven approach. First, we have the Max. Um, Yieldmax is a satellite-based agronomic advisory system. It allows us to collect field, soil, um, and uh, uh, crop data, which we can then combine with satellite data, run analysis to provide farmers with information on what type of fertilizer to use, what quantity of fertilizer to use, the variable application rates, so that the farmer is giving the crop exactly what you need. So in, in a sense, the farmer gets soil and crop specific fertilizer recommendations, but that's not all. We enable the farmer to get weekly crop health audits. So the farmer knows how well the farm is growing and he can identify areas that are in need of urgent intervention. So he saves a lot of man hours from having to go around all his field doing scouting. He also knows what the water stress is, if he needs to look for sources of irrigation to help his crop. But in addition, we use weather and meteorological data to make sure farmers understand the best good agri practice to implement part time. At the end of the crop cycle, when the harvest is mature, the farmer has a choice. He can either sell off immediately. If he decides to sell off immediately, we have a digital commodity supply service called eProcure, which allows us to aggregate different crops that the farmers produce according to their varieties and match it to um, demand from commodity buyers. On the other hand, if the farmers decide that they would like to store, through our service called StorageX, we provide the farmers with um, postpaid storage so the farmers get to store their commodities but that's not all. When the farmers store their commodities, we turn their commodities into an asset base by issuing them an electronic warehouse receipt system, which looks like something like this. It's shareable with an API with financial institutions. So what a farmer does is with the electronic warehouse receipt system, he can get up to 50% of the value of his crops. That money is a lifesaver for the farmer because it allows him to um, meet pressing financial obligations at the same time, not be pressed to sell off his produce at a time that he can get the best prices from the market. So well, how does this work? Um, because smallholder farmers in Nigeria and by extension, Sub-Saharan Africa are um, not uh, tech savvy, not literate. We use an agent-based system. First of all, we, we work with um, young people who we train in extension agronomy and um, the use of our technology. We work with them to onboard the farmers in their different locations. We then train them, train the farmers on good agri practice and collect the different data sets, which we then analyze to begin to provide the services to them. For the agronomic um, um, advisory services, we typically bundle it with um, actual products, um, products like fertilizer, seeds, and chemicals, so that farmers are actually not only getting good agri practice, but they can be guaranteed that it's actually quality inputs that they are using. They are not using inputs that are substandard in any way. So by combining input, the right inputs with 
um, good agri practice and access to market. We enable the farmer not only to increase his yields by over 30%, but to cut down post service losses by 20% while achieving reduced input usage through precision by another 20%. As a result of this, year on year, the farmers we work with are able to increase their annual incomes by 40%. This ties into our overall mission of trying to help develop a resilient food system for African agriculture, where the smallholder farmers like Hawa and people like her can earn enough to be able to afford nutritious food. Um, since we started, we've been able to um, enable over 12,000 smallholder farmers to increase their crop yields by 30%. They've also reduced post harvest losses by 20%. And the unique thing about these farmers is that all of them achieve 100% access to markets because we take a market-based approach. We first of all understand what the market needs and we get the farmers to grow the exact varieties and specifications that are in demand, which creates a captive market for them. But in addition, it also provides price guarantee for farmers. And this, as I mentioned before, results in a 40% increase in annual income for them. For us, the long-term play here um, is to continue to aggregate data from different sources, directly and from third parties, which will help, which will hope will enable us um, continue to work to develop better and better products for smallholder farmers. Products that can enable um, financial institutions understand the risk and Credit, uh, credit and um, uh, risk of farmers so that farmers can assess better financing products. Data that can help us on the, um, match farmers with um, commodity buyers who buy at fair prices. Data that can help us provide fellow satellite-based insurance and even pension services for smallholder farmers. In the long term, our goal is to help transform African agriculture by transforming smallholder farmers, helping them produce more from less. And in the end, it will tie into the global need, produce 60% more food by 2050 that will feed 9.7 billion people. So that's um, what we do at Kitovu and how we are helping build the resilient food system for African agriculture. I'll be glad to take your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Emeka. I think we'll keep the, the questions for after our last presenter, who is Jawu Ku from IFPRI. Jawu, if you want to share your screen. OK. Um, hello, everyone. Hope you are seeing my screen. OK. Good. Uh, so yeah, again, my name is Zhao Ku, a senior research fellow uh, in the in Environment and Production Technology Division at the International Food Policy Research Institute at IPRI. Um, so we conduct research to develop policy solutions that can reduce poverty and end hunger and malnutrition. And our team studies the role of technologies, including digital solutions, to help countries achieve SDGs. Uh, so today I'd like to um, yeah, present some stories um, where it will highlight uh, what policymakers need to understand and how, how to use technologies and what are the issues around the application of technologies. Okay, so let's first talk about opportunities. Sorry, it's, uh, okay, good. Uh, so at the food systems level in the context of climate risk management, uh, digital technologies provide a lot of opportunities to make data acquisition and analysis faster. And this is particularly relevant for the rapidly changing climate. Uh, in the US, for example, the number of days between billion dollar climate disaster has been reportedly reduced to just 18 days uh, in recent years. So ev every 18 days, there is another climate disaster compared to more than 80 days uh, in the 1980s. Uh, the digital technologies can speed up the data collection and analysis to react to climate risks more timely. And climate impacts are now more, more localized uh, and difficult to predict and plan against. 
predictive analytics can help plan the best prote protective measures uh, at the local level. And the, finally, for policymakers, uh, that they do not always have the best timely and reliable information to act upon. So digital technologies can improve public information systems and allowing stakeholders to access the information more quickly and monitor policy impact on the citizen. However, um, yeah, these new opportunities also highlight new challenges that need to be addressed, uh, such as the digital divide, inadequate, inadequate information, and limited digital capabilities. Uh, let me present a bit more details on what these challenges mean in practice. The first is the digital divide. Uh, the potential of digital technologies are quite clear, uh, yet each reach is not universal. Uh, rural communities are often underserved and underrepresented in information systems, and this can create biases in data and inaccurate information and even misguided decisions. I'd like to quickly show you an example that we learned ourselves about this uh, hard way. Uh, a few years ago, uh, we had a project that needed to understand the relationship between market access and the level of adopting agricultural technologies like improved seed. Uh, we did not have a lot of time. Uh, so, and the study country cell phone ownership was quite high. So we thought we could use a quick cell phone SMS-based survey. The result was reasonable to some extent. Uh, the farther you are away from the market, the level of adoption, technology adoption decreased. However, the adoption level increased in very rural areas. And, and can you guess why? We, we tried really hard to understand this pattern, uh, but we couldn't. Uh, and the reality was that, um, yeah, the, because of the high price of cell phone at, uh, and the low level of connectivity in rural areas, people who can afford to own a cell phone answer also in the survey that they are the ones uh, better off and adopt technologies more. So uh, this was just biases in data we uh, for a while misinterpreted uh, what's going on. So knowing this uh, has many implications for policy research and policy makers decision. Any strategies for collecting data in agriculture should be particularly carefully uh, evaluated and continuously uh, revised to ensure the rural population is properly represented in the information system. Um, okay, the next, the second one is inadequate information. Uh, there are many information systems already in place across economies. We even started hearing that some countries have just too many information systems and they need to be coordinated better. Evidences show that, um, the, uh, however, weak information systems with inadequate information waste budget, exacerbate poverty, and slow economic growth. Uh, existing knowledge is not always useful. Uh, this might be outdated or difficult to apply in practice. So here is another sad example that we analyzed last year recently. Uh, does anybody remember 2015-16 El Nino that created drought and flood around the world? Uh, when FAO issued a scary early warning uh, in December 2015, uh, in Zambia, uh, the government issued a precautionary export ban um, on maize grains. And however, in reality, uh, what happened was the extent of drought was not that severe and drought was only recorded uh, to, uh, in the southern part of the country and other parts of the country received normal to above normal rainfall and produced actually surplus of maize. Uh, this could have been captured in real time in information policy makers and to revise the policy. However, due to the weak information system, our government just couldn't uh, capture that uh, anomaly uh, on time. So export ban remained in place and it ended up depressing price in the market um, and even increase the poverty at the end. So yeah, this case, this case again kind of um, confirmed that siloed data really do not support evidence-based policy responses uh, who, that could have managed the risk better. Okay, the last example, our last uh, kind of topic is the limited capabilities. Uh, even if you have really good infrastructure and state-of-the-art technologies generating a lot of new data information, you also need uh, ability to understand what they mean and use them in decision-making effectively. More data in themselves are not enough to find all the answers. 
Um, technology investment should be complemented with investment in soft skills as well. Uh, here, I'd like to show you another example uh, that we failed to realize this important lesson early on ourselves. Uh, back in 2020, uh, we started a research pilot to test the value of state-of-the-art seasonal probabilistic forecast data. This data set uh, provided detailed six-month climate forecast on rainfall and temperature anomalies, on anomalies around the world. It was really exciting. Um, so in this map, um, generated using the same data set in April 2020, we saw the South Asia, especially in India, would enter dry spells. So we alerted our colleagues on the ground uh, to prepare for this. Uh, but then what happened in May 2020 was the historic flood uh, that recorded the largest scale property damage and hundreds of deaths. Uh, the twist of this story is that, in fact, but the forecast was not wrong. It was probabilistic and the map only showed the median forecast. And we did have some scenarios, a probabilistic forecast scenario that are predicted flood, but we just didn't realize how to use the probabilistic information. Um, and, uh, and we didn't know uh, at the time uh, what kind of different interpretation skills that we needed to generate insight. Um, so what, we, what have we learned here? Uh, there are many exciting digital technology pilots out there, uh, but they should be introduced together with continued research and even human-centered design to learn how to use and how to present them and also how not to do so. Uh, otherwise, we might keep on developing pilots that do not really scale, uh, even worse, uh, misguide decisions. So thanks for your attention, and I will see you again shortly at the Q&A session. Thank you very much, Jaou, for this very interesting uh, presentation. Um, we have we've had a couple of questions in the Q and A uh, box, but I've seen that uh, the presenters have answered most of them. Um, maybe uh, some of the for some of the questions that have already been answered, some of you would like to. Uh, go back on it and give more details. If not, I, I have a question for Xinyi. Oh, well, you wanted to talk anyway, so you can go oh, ahead and yeah, I, I can ask my question uh, after. I, I noticed that there was a question in the chat box. So I was just going through yeah. the ones in the um, Q&A. So yes, there was a question about the uh, profit uh, for our platform and how long it took for us to form. And I saw that there was another one uh, posed by uh, Paulson as well about different profit sources for investors who develop an online platform. So I thought I would just address um, both of them. So on our platform, um, so just to make it clear, we're an e-commerce marketplace. So consumers, on, on the one hand, they would install the app and they can discover all of these products. And then the farmers, they are the ones who are listing their products or their produce on the platform. So what we charge is a very small transaction service fee. So that is mainly to cover the payment processing costs. So the you know, uh, consumer is paying 20 RMB to the farmer or whatever it is, and there's a small uh, sort of payment transfer fee that has to be incurred anyway. So we charge that on the sales. And then the main uh, sort of revenue stream on our platform where the majority of our profits come from is actually through advertising. So on the platform, um, the merchants can choose to advertise their products if they want to. So it's all part of you know, running a business. So if you don't want to advertise, it's okay. But if you actually see that you know, advertising gives you good returns, helps you get more sales, you can do that as well. So um, actually when you compare kind of the, um, uh, the sales volume or the, the, the dollar value of what we sell on the platform, versus our actual revenue stream, the revenue stream is very small, right? So because it's, it's just dependent on that marketing. So, uh, you know, not every single uh, transaction has a high commission fee or whatever it is. And the idea behind that is really to lower the barriers to entry because we want to make it easy and convenient for farmers to onboard and sell their products. 
So that's uh, kind of the question on the business model there. I think there was a similar um, business model question addressed to you, Jamie, for um, virtual agronomist. Um, yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, I mentioned briefly in the chat, but our, our model is to um, uh, is to essentially sell to the aggregators who are providing um, services to smallholders. So in our model, the, there's customization done for an individual value chain and region. So you need to get together enough farmers that that makes sense, you know, that that can be affordable. Uh, so we work through partnership with an aggregator and these aggregators already have typically a uh, connection with their smallholder farmers. So they're often, uh, they often have some kind of extension. I mean, obviously, by the way, our, our situation is very different in Africa to, uh, <laughs> uh, to Zunis in, um, in China. So the digital connectivity is not as strong. Um, there's still this last mile piece with extension agents. And so they are offering often um, a bundle of services. So input provision, because the logistics is difficult, as well as guaranteed offtake, as well as credit to harvest. And so they strengthen their service to smallholders by adding this individualized advisory. So that, that's, that's basically how it works. Great, thank you. Um, I see that in the Q&A, we have um, lots of questions coming from for Emeka, sorry. So um, I'm just gonna add them to you right now, Emeka, because I, I see that you want to answer them. Anyway. Right. So um, a question is, uh, has uh, Kitovo been operating long enough to know whether this will be sufficient to cover your costs? Okay. Uh... Yes, um, we actually started operations in 2018. Um, so year on year, we've been increasing our revenues. Uh, in the long term, we are going to be profitable. One of the challenges we had, or the drawbacks, um, is the fact that, and I say this uh, with a sense of, um, you know, um, understanding of the problems. Uh, for Africa, digitization alone is not going to solve the problem. It's not, it's not a silver bullet. We still have um, critical challenges around um, the lack of uh, farming and post-harvest infrastructure. So, um, and then, you know, the, the issues around um, farmers' access to financing. Those two have been critical bottlenecks for us. Um, so the approach we've taken um, is to combine different uh, product and services together, bundling it together, um, so that um, we can be able to provide something that is critically of value to farmers. Yeah, so it's, um, it's we, we are increasing our attraction every year, and in the long term, it's going to be profitable. Well, that's great for you. <laughs> um, there is another question that would be specific uh, to Ghana for you, Emeka, which is which digital technology is the best for linking rural farmers to markets in a country such as, as Ghana? Yes, so um, Ghana, like other sub-Saharan African countries, um, there are two peculiarities that um, stand out. That's the fact that um, in distant pockets where most of the production happens, there is very low connectivity. Um, and then, of course, there is also the challenge of the literacy levels of farmers. So any solution um, that is going to uh, create linkages for farmers, first of all, in terms of the model, it has to be agent-based. Um, it, it wouldn't necessarily interact with the farmers directly. Uh, and then if, we do, if, if it will interact with the farmers directly, um, it needs to be SMS or USSD based. Even then, um, it has to factor in um, the need for um, aggregation, aggregation and centers because um, you can't possibly source something that has effective um, sense for supply from just one smallholder 
corner because of the fragmented nature. So you need to consider all that in trying to design a solution that works for either Ghana or any other sub-Saharan African country. Thank you, Emeka. Thank you very much. Um, maybe uh, do some of the panelists have questions to ask to the other panelists since it's your area of expertise? Maybe you, you would like to ask each other some questions. If not, I, I can ask a question and you can jump in if you if you think this is something that you you would have the expertise to, to answer. So um, what can be done proactively to involve historically marginalized communities like women, youth, people in extremely remote locations in the digitalization of agriculture? Okay, let me let me jump in a bit. Um, from the uh, sub-Saharan African context. So um, the reality here is that uh, women don't, don't or are not given a voice when it comes to decision-making. Even when you want to do trainings or good agri practice um, uh, trainings, um, they are usually left out, which also means that um, they are typically left out of most interventions. Um, so, First of all, I think um, in designing digitalization programs, um, there has to be a level of intention uh, and deliberation, like this is what we want to do to empower farmers. In our instance, um, because of the fragmented nature of farmers, we usually make sure that we put farmers in clusters. So if you put farmers in clusters, it's easier to use all, all, all sorts of mechanization among them. So one of the rules to put in place, for instance, is that for, for a cluster to be formed, it has to be made up of 40% women. Um, because um, each cluster has the potential of getting some sort of input financing, that is, they get the input bundled with the services on credit and pay at the end of harvest. It's an incentive for them to be willing to change behavior. Otherwise, they would not. So there has to be that level of intentionality, uh, knowing what these challenges are, knowing some of these drawbacks, whether religious or customary um, uh, constraints that limit women participation in this. Um, one has to do that into the design. Then, then the other thing is, um, trying to also understand and walk in the shoes of the people you reach. So, so in, some, in some parts of my country, for instance, um, the, the active religion um, sort of um, has rules about how you engage a man versus how you engage a woman. So putting that into context will allow you to navigate some of those conflicting areas, for instance, if you have areas like that, you, you make sure that your agents and the people who are your last mile touch points with the farmers can be people of the same gender. So that way, it gives the locals, it allows them the flexibility to trust you to want to be part of what you are doing. Um, as against trying to um, um, go against them and you know um, escalating potentials of conflict. Those are some of the ways that we've navigated some of these issues and how I think that um, in building such solutions, it's important to take all these sorts of things into context. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emeka. Uh, does anyone else want to jump in and jump in on this question? Yes, yes. So yeah, I mean, this is really hard and excellent question, and it's really hard to solve. Um, so one of the cases uh, that I heard, it's not. Uh, our work but, uh, in Kenya, I saw a case uh, when they wanted to bring more women farmers uh, to these digital uh, innovations and uh, use more digital tools. And when they provide training and capacity building, they actually invited men, uh, but they, they asked them to bring your wife, uh, bring your family members and bring them all together to this event. Only then you can be eligible to participate in this 
training. So I, I think that's, that goes back to Emika's point that it's really intentional, really carefully designed to bring that out, uh, bring women out of their household and empower them into the system. And yeah, this will require a lot of innovative thinking and experiment and research. Thank you, Jim. Yeah, Can just you? to chime in okay. very quickly, I think um, at least the experience on our platform is that uh, because it is about increasing market access and at the same time, I think the challenges that we have uh, with the aging farming population is that there, there sometimes isn't really that much of a, a choice, right? Oftentimes it is the men who have left to go to the cities to work uh, in construction jobs or other jobs. So it's the women folk, it's the elderly who are still uh, manning the fields. So I think uh, what we've seen is actually to the extent that now, um, you know, e-commerce has lowered the barriers. Um, you know, some of these uh, people still in the countryside, they're actually better to, uh, they're, they're better able to engage, right, with the sales because, you know, sometimes actually for things like, say, live streaming, right, talking to customers, handling customer service, those are things where actually, um, you know, there, there, there are some uh, benefits, right, for, for say, women to, to handle those kinds of uh, roles uh, as opposed to just a pure, like, in a farming defined kind of role where you do have to have a certain amount of manual inputs. So I think what we've been trying to do is to ensure that you know, our courses are um, available both online as well as offline. So even in areas where uh, maybe it's a bit more remote um, or the people are less educated, um, you know, it's, it's below the poverty line, we're still able to sort of send in our uh, teams um, together with the experts to deliver the training that they need. Yeah, I wanted to just add one thing quickly. Uh, one thing we are very uh, interested in uh, trying it out uh, in near near future is the citizen science project. Um, so yeah, as Jamie uh, pointed, there are lots of data needs. Uh, so there is a continuous kind of feedback loop of more data becomes more kind of insight and improving the quality of uh, this uh, recommendation and things. And yeah, we, there, there has been a lot of citizen science movement, uh, especially in research area because of the lack of enough, uh, never enough trading data and things like that. So we are trying to understand if the citizen science project uh, participating in those projects also empowers women. Uh, it's, we, we are trying to kind of develop kind of army of women um, being trained to collect data like ODK and different type of data collection tools. And we want to also track uh, whether they really get more empowered by participating in those projects and get their own kind of, um, you know, skills and, and they get propagated to other types of digital making processes. So now I think there are probably, again, the innovative uh, opportunities here and there we can learn and trying to understand the impact and also, yeah, the, uh, share across the world. We have another question for, for you, Jawu, on the Q&A about like, did you ultimately find that the inputs and yields decline with the distance and time from the market? Ah, so when we uh, took that into account, uh, the low adoption of cell phone in the rural areas, uh, yes, and that was kind of expected pattern. We, we wanted to see how quickly that degrade from the market. And yeah, so that, that was, uh, yeah, so we kind of hypothesized, hypothesized that that's the trend and then we confirmed it. But yeah, just again, we had some anomalies because of that uh, imperfect our sampling frame and understanding how much of the cell phone coverage was low, lower than we expected. Actually, it goes back to Jamie's one of the slides uh, in cartoon, the average is three feet, but actually there's a big one. We had exactly the same situation. In that country, uh, the average cell phone, number of cell phones per household household was more than one, either 1 1.2 or something. But in reality, it's a lot condensed and concentrated in urban areas, so rural areas, it was really not the case and we didn't understand before doing this exercise. Thank you. And I have a question for you, uh, Xinyi, following, uh, so we, you presented your um, 10 billion initiative. Uh, have you already thought about where uh, you think we should prioritize the investment uh, to bring more efficiencies in the agricultural systems? 
Yeah, thanks, Clara. So I think uh, one area that we're very interested in is around the midstream, how to make the midstream more efficient. Um, so, you know, I think compared to uh, Western um, sort of developed countries or like the US, for instance, the cold chain capacity per capita in China is still actually relatively low. So it's only about a third. So that means that um, actually a lot of the fresh produce, uh, it doesn't get transported in a cold chain truck. So um, that also leads to a very high food loss and waste rate along the way. So one part of the solution is actually just to improve the utilization of the trucks as well. So obviously there is a need to invest in the infrastructure and to ramp it up. So we're also in talks with um, the third party logistics providers on how they can do that. But I think it's also important to show them that through actually a better use of the data, through forecasting, for instance, with the existing assets that you have, you can already just make better use of them, right? So you, you directly have an impact on reducing food loss and waste while also ensuring that the logistics provider still makes more money at the end of it all, right? So that's gotta be a very important incentive to make sure that um, you know, the people who are providing the services also see a, a tangible benefit, right? Not just purely from kind of the environmental perspective, oh, you should do it because, you know, it's it's better for the environment or it's better for cutting out loss, but you, you should do it because you can actually make more money, right? You can be more efficient, you can save on fuel, et cetera. So that's very tangible to them. So that's one area that we're, we're actually uh, been, been talking to the third-party logistics providers for quite some time. And I think on the upstream uh, regarding agricultural technology, that's really where we expect to be investing more as well, because we've seen a lot of great technologies um, all around the world, um, but they need some, um, you know, adapting, right, for the smallholder context in China. So that's also where we've been spending uh, more of our time and also looking at potential research collaborations. Oh, and if I could just share as well, I did share in the answer to one of the uh, questions in the chat. Uh, an example of the research collaborations would be, uh, we just announced a project with Wageningen University in the Netherlands, where we're actually um, studying how we can use different types of uh, lighting, uh, as well as um, treatment of the uh, growing solution to alter the nutritional value of the crops. So I understand, you know, in some places, the emphasis is still more on the yield, but I think um, looking at controlled environment uh, agriculture as that also grows to become a bigger part of our uh, food system, right, especially for food security purposes or to locate it closer to urban centers, as the cost of these technologies come down, there's also a lot more that can be achieved. Uh, by using them not just through improving yields. So that's also an angle that we're looking at because we do see that amongst the consumers, there are also consumers with preferences for um, you know, higher quality or more nutritional products. But it's not always the case that these need to be imported products. They don't need to travel from thousands of miles away or be brand name products. You could potentially, through the use of technologies, through LED lights, for instance, um, you know, produce more nutritional products uh, for the consumers. Thank you. And um, in the first question that we got in the q and in, in the chat, a lot of them were about sharing knowledge between different regions, country, uh, or developed countries and, and um, developing countries. Uh, do you know if this is something that is currently really happening, if there is currently discussion? Uh, for example, uh, Xinyi, you are based in China. Do you know if you have uh, some countries that would be interested in learning from what you've done to implement it in, in their countries? Or maybe Jamie, same thing uh, for what you've been doing in Africa. Do you have some regions? that, uh, well, not regions, but uh, governments that maybe have contacted you to try and have the same thing in their region? Um, maybe I'll go first. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of, um, uh, there are the large agricultural research organizations um, that the CG centers, some of you will know of, um, who do coordinate a lot of this kind of activity, particularly between, um, there's a lot between African governments. Uh, so we've been talking to the, the government of Rwanda um, about this. They probably within Africa have the largest um, 
the most advanced digitization program for their farmers. It's part of their subsidy system. Um, but actually, uh, probably the best example of the kind of thing we're doing uh, globally, I'm aware of, is in the Philippines, where there's a, um, a research project which is called Rice uh, Crop Manager, uh, has been adopted by the government. So this is something that came out of research, has now been adopted at very large scale, um, millions of farmers using it. And they are generating the kind of longitudinal data that you'd expect for that. There are, there are examples in India too, but it's a bit more fragmented amongst the states, I believe. Uh, rather than being at a, at a national level. So yeah, my sense is there's a lot of uh, data sharing is probably harder than idea sharing. Um, particularly a, a topic we get into a lot is ownership of data um, that, you know, farmers need to own their data. It's, it's difficult, I think. Um, historically, there, there's a lot of data been generated without really taking that into account. And, and I think people are now becoming much more savvy about it. Um, and that's becoming a bigger issue. It's also just very difficult. I mean, obviously, researchers, they produce data to, to produce research. They're not necessarily incentivized to share. And so naturally, you know, that's an extra thing for them to do. And that becomes difficult. Um, so, um, yeah, it's one of those things I think there's no easy answer. It's always a lot of work. Um, yeah, I, I can quickly comment on that. Uh, when there was a food system summit uh, last year, uh, there were a lot of excitement and idea sharing, also uh, kind of planning for the future, um, kind of convening, just like uh, what Clara, you, you mentioned, um, the, for the, all the different parts, the different parts of the food system, actors who use digital services and digital innovation to collaborate and uh, kind of working together in some kind of pre-competitive space. So there is something CGIR and also Pindodo, uh, we, we are participating in something called Global Coalition for Digital Food Systems. Uh, it's kind of commitment for action. And I will share the link on the chat. Uh, I think I, I haven't seen actual like activities planned yet, uh, but there is certainly a lot of energy and enthusiasm and kind of momentum there uh, built uh, since the Food System Summit. So I hope something will happen and so there will be a venue to continue developing the collaboration and the knowledge sharing and yeah, innovation sharing. Yeah, I think uh, on, on that note, actually, uh, so I think actually I, I was on another session with Jawu also, I think last year. Um, so also sharing about the Pintodo model. So I think there has definitely been a lot of interest, um, particularly in the wake of COVID. I think people were kind of trying to rethink um, you know, how food distribution, um, you know, maybe should work. Uh, so a lot of uh, interest um, spoken to people in ASEAN, um, also in uh, Latin America, you know, all with a lot of interest in terms of how they can replicate, of course, in the US as well. Uh, so just yesterday, I was sharing with a, a group uh, of students in the US who were also asking, oh, why isn't there such a system in the US for farmers to sell their produce directly to consumers? So I think, um, you know, for us, typically, what we would emphasize is that a lot of it does depend on the local conditions. So I think uh, we're, you know, very lucky that when we start out in 2015 in China, the logistics infrastructure had already been pretty well developed. Um, there was a lot of investments. So you're actually able to have a pretty reliable and low cost uh, logistics service, which may not be possible for other parts of the world today, right? So you do need some of that hard physical asset to be uh, infrastructure to be built out and to achieve a certain level of reliability so that it then becomes economically viable to be shipping you know, boxes of fruit, right? And ensuring that the box of fruit arrives in a given time at the consumer's place in a decent condition, right? So a lot of that um, unfortunately does require quite a lot of investments uh, on the part of governments and maybe some corporates as well. And then also the issue of digital connectivity, that's also one as well. So uh, when we have started, a lot of uh, the consumers in China as well as the farmers they at least had um, you know, a pretty basic smartphone, right? So low cost smartphone where they can chat with their friends, they can also uh, exchange money or they can you know, uh, spend some money online. And so they were looking to do that. They had the tools to do it. And so we kind of um, you know, stepped in to, to, to fill some of that need uh, for, for shopping, for easy communication and sharing with friends, et cetera, uh, in a fun and interactive way. So I think there are a number of things that are important to have in place to facilitate such a system. So, you know, we're very happy to share about our experience uh, with 
other countries or other institutions that are interested. But we also are very aware that um, you know there are a unique set of uh, sort of conditions that do need to be in place for something like that to take off and, and succeed. Okay, um, let me jump in a bit. Um, I think not just uh, the sharing of data and knowledge is absolutely important, um, especially if we realize that um, the problem we have ahead of us is, is not one that can be solved by one actor. Um, and it's actually um, a global problem. Um, you know, the problem of food insecurity is one that affects everyone one way or the other, regardless of how how countries think they are far removed from challenges happening around the globe. The world is so connected now. However, you know, um, one challenge here, especially from the sub-Saharan African context is that um, we have almost little to fall back on. Like you have almost no data at all. So um, in, in, in some other parts of the world, so somehow you have maybe some sort of publicly available data that you can then build upon. But what happens in this context is you are almost doing everything from scratch. The reality is that data is very, very expensive. Collecting data is very, very expensive. Now, I can, I, I'm saying this from the context of, um, you know, uh, startup players in the sub-Saharan African uh, space, trying to bring a context as to why I understand why sometimes it looks like it's difficult to share, share data. And that's because um, they've taken time to collect this data, to develop this data. They feel like this data should serve them, be an advantage to them. But I think that um, one way um, that innovators can go around this is that first and foremost, we must come to the point where we begin to see some of these things that data is, is actually for public good, right? And work together to collaborate. Strategic partnerships makes it easy so that uh, when you are doing something in an area where someone else has done that, you don't have to completely reinvent the wheel. But a situation where everyone keeps operating in silos it actually makes it much more difficult to scale because if I'm if I'm if I'm focused on having to do everything, collect data in one area, build upon that, keep growing, it would take me a long time than if I had some form of data sharing with someone um, that I can build upon. Um, it would be really great if innovators like myself in Sub-Saharan Africa um can learn how to collaborate even while they compete thank you Emika. i i have a follow-up question for you and for for everyone so with the light we've put on the contribution of agriculture and the food system to the global gg emissions and um the fact that we the, the, the international community could do something to try and, and put more weights on the innovation to try and reduce emission and increase mitigation. Do you think that um, it could be um, a good way to, to manage, uh, for example, uh, access to more data or, or, or to, to get more data because it, it would be justified by the fact that it would increase mitigation and it would uh, get everyone closer to the 2030 uh, sustainable agenda. Do you think this is something that could uh, drive uh, a movement to, to get uh, all the things that you really need to, to, to have um, uh, to reach mass adoption of innovation everywhere in the world to, to, uh, to use the tools like yours and everyone that has presented today? Yeah, I can start, and I, I I really believe yeah that's really 
kind of missing opportunity that, that we, can, we can leverage and exploit here. Uh, I, I did my graduate study in Northern Ghana, Upper West region of Ghana. Uh, it's really degraded uh, uh, sandy soil and low input system. And, and what I did there was using remote sensing and different kind of crop modeling approaches to estimate how much carbon sequestration, carbon kind of mitigation can happen uh, in that area, even under that really low input system if farmers change their management practices. And, and I, I did that also in Southern part of Ghana and to be uh, in comparative with each other. And, and, and Southern part of Ghana, so it is more fertile, it has more biomass in it. Uh, the farmers were more well, uh, well aware of the soil condition and how to manage soil and things like that, quite different. But um, quite, uh, quite surprisingly, we saw more potential possible uh, in Northern Ghana when soil is really degraded. Because of low degradation, there is actually more opportunity to bring more soil carbon into the pool when they manage soil better. Uh, uh, you know, in the right way. So similarly, I think across Africa, when, whenever there is a low input and very degraded soil condition, it's really hard to manage in the right amount of fertilizer and right of management practices. I think that could be easily, uh, not, not easily, that could one day be turned into opportunities for putting more carbon into the soil and such that then might even turn into carbon credit they can use in other types of infrastructure investment. Yeah, we, we talked about connectivity issue. We ourselves are not, uh, not able to really solve the problem, but in the collectively that's a big, another innovative revenue stream for countries to realize uh, if this could be really systematically managed. So yeah, again, uh, so I mean, there is a huge potential to manage soil better in uh, low input farming systems. And I think that will be really win-win solution that we all need to be, yeah, look after. Thank you very much, Jawu. Um, if no one from the panel has anything to add, I think I will have to uh, give some closing remarks because we're getting closer to the hour. Um, so thank you everyone for participating in today's webinar. Um, we've had four uh, presenters uh, giving presentation on the different uh, innovation and digital tools uh, that they may be using across the globe. And we had Jawu giving, uh, that gave a, a more global presentation. Um, the thing that I really take from this webinar is that uh, we really need to, to focus on um, giving access to learning materials and um, to, to allow marginalized population to really have access to all these innovation tools because they are uh, at the, the, the places where um, they are producing most of our agriculture food for the small small holders and uh, and other communities um, and uh, yeah so I, I really want to thank you for this really interesting uh, webinar. Uh, I want to remind you that uh, the, the recording will be made available on the SDSN website and that we will also share the, the presentations because most uh, a lot of people have asked for them. Um, so I want to thank you again and I'll let you get back to everyone's work. Thank you.